Good morning. These are three scientists, three mission drivers, fierce, feminist, fearless, three icons of India. Please note, I haven't said women yet, though I'm extremely proud that they are three women. A big round of applause. such an honor to be here with the three of you, and I'll straight get to where it started. How did it begin, besides just lying down and watching the stars? I'll go with you, Dr. Anupurni. Yeah, so I grew up in a, a remote village where I could see stars. Now it is not even possible to see the sun. So <laughs> that is the status, but it was possible to the, the, the stars in the sky, and I was surprised by the night, nighttime, the, the, the brilliant stars in the sky, as well as watching the Milky Way in the morning from my hometown. Yeah. You really make me feel like going to your hometown, because you're right, we can barely see the sun. But no, but happened. there also there is a problem. So I, I mean, I must tell you that there's something called a power cut. So that has really forced everything to switch off, and we could clearly see the, night, uh, the, the stars. Well, we're really thankful for those power cuts, because that's why where you are is where you are. Okay. Let's uh, just turn back time a little bit um, uh, with you. You know, your parents were um, obviously not interested in astrophysics, as you turned out to be. What was it like uh, growing up as a young girl in that part of the you know, world, and, say, and more importantly, that time of the world? and say, you know what, I'm raising my hand and I'm headed to a laboratory. Yeah, um, the thing is, uh, there was like nobody, they were stopping me from doing what I wanted to do. But the thing is that the environment was not conducive. Like, you know, I grew up in a, my parents were musicians. They are Carnatic vocalists, they are trained uh, and uh, old fashioned and also conservative and very hardliners. So you have to get up in the morning and practice whatever comes. So I have to sing or I play violin, I have to get up in the morning and practice violin. And that has to be the schedule. And all, all thing happens in the house is about music. Anything about discussions, even, I, even my mother sings, I have to take notation what she's <laughs> singing. So I'm trained to take notations immediately. So thinking about science is completely different. That's what I'm passionate about. So I, I have to find time and do my science. So the only thing they told me was that if you are passionate about go for it. There's no problem with it. But there were certain conditions, like I can't go out and study. They stopped me from taking up engineering. So after master's, I said, nothing doing. I am going out and then doing it. And I had to convince them. Yeah. yeah. But I love the sound of that. I need time to find science in the middle of music. That's amazing, lovely. And uh, to know that you're a Carnatic uh, violinist, inspirational. Nandini, coming to you, uh, you know, taking India through many missions, uh, like all of you here, this is heavy stuff on the shoulders, but it's all great to talk on this stage today. How did you get onto the stage? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, first of all, thank you for having me here. It's an honor to be here, and it's wonderful to be amongst this audience. Um, so, uh, mine is a slightly different story, actually. Um, my uh, parents are, uh, I come from an educated, very educated family. Uh, my mother is a mathematician and my father is a techno bureaucrat. And um, um, so, they, they studied in the 50s and 60s and uh, my grandparents got all their sons and daughters educated at, back then and well-educated. So um, at home, we were children of working parents, uh, but I believe that children of working parents are brought up differently. They're totally independent, bold, and strong. So that was the positive part of it. And uh, I still remember as an eight-year-old, I would cycle uh, alone to school. Uh, I got my car driving license the day I turned 18. <laughs> and. Um, um, and you know, my parents, especially my father, uh, he would, um, he would uh, 
analyze and explain to us not just the physics of how things were happening around us, uh, but the kind of environment we had at home. Uh, let's say, you know, uh, let's talk about um, uh, global politics, world economics, sports. He would distill all the information and present it to us in a very concise way so that we develop that uh, diverse perspective, you know. So I feel uh, parents are the beacon of inspiration and I hope to do so for my girls too. <laughs> Indeed. So, Dr. Nigar Shahji, uh, you are called the sunny lady of this country. Um, and you, I, you, you went into college saying that I'm going to do what others don't, right? The choices you made, I don't think there were many, very many girl students anyway. But tell us about why did you want to pick what others didn't? And what was it? Uh, I don't know. Uh, basically, uh, from the beginning, I'm like that since school. I always wanted to do, uh, which is uh, a rare, somebody has not done it. So at that point of time, when we were gro uh, growing up in uh, 70s, 60s, my parents were very uh, particular that we should be financially, that their kids could have a good education. And my father is a mass graduate, but chose to be an agriculturist. So he was very particular that uh, we do uh, some science and we should be financially independent. So that's how my journey started. And uh, that's why I, that may be an inborn capability, or I don't know. I always like to do what others don't, um, not commonly done. So at that point of time, when my started uh, after uh, 12th standard, it was uh, very less uh, women were doing engineering. Uh, so I opted for engineering, though my parents were very much uh, for me to do a uh, medicine so that I can have my profession anywhere where, when I get married and I can start my profession anywhere uh, in place. But if engineering, then you have to go for a job in a faraway place in the country. So that was their attitude. There was, that's what their idea. But I decided I will do engineering and that too. I wanted to do mechanical engineering. At that point of time, not many women were admitted to mechanical engineering. So I tried hard to be a mechanical engineer, but I was not offered a seat in mechanical engineering because I'm women. So I settled with the electronics and communication engineering. And so you just said that I'm going to just keep very doable goals like taking India to the sun. No, it's uh, not my goal. Actually, it is the organization goal. I was uh, given a chance to be part of that goal. That for that, I'm very grateful to the organization to chose me for that role. But I think in many ways, what you bring to the table is this absolutely feisty energy to see that I am truly going to live up to that point that I will pick up what others don't. Yeah, because that was always uh, I tried to do. Here also, it's not. But one way, organization also helped. Because in ISRO, there is no uh, glass ceiling or uh, there is a difference or uh, the gender. Uh, parity is there. So if you show that you can do things, they will give an opportunity for you to do. So that's how I got this opportunity, I feel. In that spirit, I must say we're thankful uh, to ISRO because the image of ISRO to the world is women. And in so many ways, I think the last many missions uh, and the ones to come in the future uh, will remain so. I want to pick something that you said, Dr. Shaji, and actually bring that out uh, to the panel. All of you at some point or the other talk about your role as a mother. Uh, and also the kind of travails it throws up in all our journeys. So uh, maybe I should start with you, uh, Dr. Anupurni. Now, when you think of yourself as somebody who has had to navigate what all women tend to uh, be faced with, maternity, mobility, uh, and of course, uh, you know, your professional career, do you try to seek balance? Um, yes and no, both, because as a person, you need to be happy with yourself and your, 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 your aims and objectives are met. But at the same time, you can't be uh, uh, bending to all the requirements which are put forward. So you have to find and convince yourself what you think is achievable and I would like to achieve and achieve it. And don't uh, uh, cut corners on that. But then identify what you don't want to do, what somebody else is imposing on you and avoid it. Don't completely say, no, I will not do it. So there has to be some distinction. And second thing is, and second thing is as uh, someone who wants to do multiple things, you can't do everything every day. 
So you have to do something some days, and sometimes work overtakes family. Some days family overtakes work. But that happens. But you have to take an average over a large, large period of time. Having said that, I mean, as a woman who goes through different, life is a package deal. You have to face things, reality in everyday life. So problems do come, but they change. Yeah. When I'm young, the, the kind of problems I faced is not the problems I'm facing now. So I have to innovate and kind of strike a balance saying that, okay, I'm happy with bo doing both and try to manage because family support is important. And family, like, you know, you have young children and then the children grow up, you have, uh, you know, the parents are older, so things keep changing. You have to take their confidence at all the time. And they so support. We're them. having this discussion in 2024. Back when you were, um, you know, at the early start of your career, did you have to face the word compromise a lot? And did you find that you were sometimes alone in that journey because the support system wasn't geared up, or was it? Um, support, was, support system was not geared up, so it was difficult. I, I had my parents' support uh, most of the time, so it was not that uh, uh, difficult. But my husband was like, you know, he was always on his job and he's always moving. So it's up to me to manage my health, my children's health, and everything at home, and the work. Yeah. So that's what I said. Sometimes I will be spending one week fully at work, but the next week someone is sick at home. I have to take charge of it. So I have to take a step back and say that, okay, slow down. This week I'll do this, this is what I can. And next week you push back. So I take an average over a month, it works out well, yeah. Yeah, push back certainly works. Nandini, what has it been for you? Um, you know, you kept talking about, I wish I could do this for my children. Uh, I, I could sense that there is, there is always that thing that's playing on our minds, right? Our children, our house, and that lovely two-word two phrase, multitasker. Yeah, uh, you're absolutely right, you know, and a lot of people ask uh, all of us this question that uh, how do you strike a balance? And I think juggling family and work uh, is walking a tightrope many a times, many a times. And um, uh, sometimes uh, when, you know, there's something, there's a crisis in the family and there's some extremely important project it's like running an obstacle race on a tightrope. <laughs> so, uh, but it's not always so. I mean, things yeah. do settle down and um, I feel the mantra is the same. What we follow at work, uh, the mantra is teamwork. Teamwork makes dreams work. So, um, at least in our family, uh, we follow that and, you know, the responsibilities are shared. Everybody pitches in. And uh, you have, uh, um, you know, the responsibility of caregiving and running the household divided. So th that way things are um, simplified. And I think that's one strategy I think most working women should adopt. And like you said, we're all extremely good planners. Uh, we just not only plan our missions, we plan our lives. I mean, we think like many days, weeks in advance, even for things that happen at home. And um, yeah, all said and done, uh, you know, the support system is important. I think women should not shy to take support from their family, society, relatives, whoever it is, because it's definitely not possible to do this alone. And, um, you know, way back when I joined ISRO, there were very few women in the division that I worked because these missions call for, uh, especially during the launch times, uh, it called for long hours of work. And uh, not many women wanted to actually volunteer to, you know, come to the division itself. But today we see there's so many women who are mission directors and they, you know, it's irony that uh, what was considered as a domain not suitable for women. Today women have earned the tag of being reliable and very, very dependable. Yes. So um, that's how it is. So let me, let me just poke you a little bit and ask you, did you at some point face this dilemma and what did you tell yourself? I'm okay if my chapatis are not round, but I'm taking India to the moon. Did you, did you tell yourself that? 
I mean, it's there. I mean, almost every day it's the story, right? And you don't have to be perfect in everything that you do at home, or because because this uh, uh, eventually, I think, um, what I generally see is we need to change the mindset, right? The mindset of uh, the woman being this, having the sole responsibility for running the household needs to change. Yeah. So, uh, so once that change, I think changes, I think the rest of the thing will automatically settle down. Yeah, I think everyone agrees with that. Uh, Dr. Shaji, uh, balance to you, it's a myth. I, do you think women, as women, we're just chasing the wrong thing if you're trying to balance? No, first of all, I don't agree that uh, why women should, everybody should chase uh, their own, uh, uh, whatever their ideas or uh, their, uh, uh, their goals in life, everybody. It need not be just for women or men. Everybody need to do, that's what I believe in. So here also, this, everybody is talking about this work-life balance. Because yeah. I feel uh, uh, so, so much importance is attached to this work life. We need not uh, think of work life balance. We can integrate uh, the life along with the work and see at e each point of time which is the priority and what you want to do, or like that, you can decide and move on. So, that way, if you integrate it, you need not see it very isolated way and why to do your balance and uh, don't have a guilty feeling that I have not balanced it. That's what I practice. So it's integrate at each because uh, there is no uh, simple model to solve everyone's solution. Everyone has uh, different circumstances and different solutions. So it's different for everyone. So take, uh, integrate it and uh, prioritize it and each point of time you take a proper decision and move along with it. Yeah. You know, let me ask you, uh, and I'll go around this, this time this way. But you all talk so much about the work um, and in the kind of uh, dreams that you all have chased. But I never seem to hear that, you know, how did you keep up with this? How did your health keep up with it? Did somebody come and tell you, listen, Nigar Shaji, this is what you need to do to stay healthy and ahead. And how do you manage it? And do you do anything about it? Talk to us about that. Women and women's health is such a forgotten yeah. subject. Yeah, that's, uh, health is very important because uh, in Tamil we say, that's without a wall, you cannot draw a picture. That's the common saying in Tamil. So it's very, very important. I keep up my health by, see, daily, I have a half an hour, I will allocate for a, uh, whatever may be the thing, I half an hour I allocate for walking and do, and whenever I have a free time on Saturdays, Sundays, I do all the house goes and I love doing housekeeping. And on free time, if I have, uh, time I love trekking. I go for uh, very often trekking. So that's how I keep my ment uh, physical health. Mental health, I don't do anything exclusively, but always I uh, try to keep a positive attitude and my uh, spirits high by my hobbies of reading, gardening, etc. That's how I practice. Dr. Anapurni, when was the last time somebody asked you, are you stressed? How do you deal with it? Yeah, I think you are completely right. I was just uh, um, thinking about a few days ago, and then I realized that no one at home asked, how are you managing with your, your stress levels? Nobody asked that. It's taken for granted that you somehow manage everything and somehow do this and take a one with swoosh, swash, everything gets done. So that's the general, um, I mean, it, it is just, it's just, she's okay. So that's sometimes taken for granted. So I had to blurt it out because, you know, it was uh, high time everybody realized that. But um, I also have put in uh, a framework at home that I don't make everyone's breakfast. Everybody has to make their own breakfast. If you don't know how to make it, please find out how to make it, or you can go without breakfast. So can we give it up a little loudly? I know the men are feeling like I'll keep this weak. Louder. So the good side of that was my children knew exactly how to survive. And now they are outside the country and they know how to survive now yes. there. That really women, helped. women don't belong to the kitchen. Men also do because yeah, so cooking is I'm, a life skill. I'm traveling outside quite a bit. My husband also knows how to make the breakfast for himself and survives. So it's not the problem of, uh, it's just that extra effort and push required for them to do it. And second aspect which has also happened is that 
My children also know that it's very important to have your, uh, you know, physical activity. So if I have two options, do something in the kitchen that I'm stuck in the morning and not able to go, my, uh, go, go for my run, my son would come and say, doesn't matter, you go for your run, I will chip in and I'll finish this. So you have to tell. You have to open your mouth and tell this is the, this is the fact, this is the, uh, this is the framework in which you will work, everybody should fall in. Yeah. It's a bit like when people would say that, how do women ask for promotions and salary hikes? The answer is raise your hand, do the same at home, and ask everybody to pitch in. Nandini, I'm going to twist this question a little bit, um, connected to health, mental health. Nandini, ko gussa kyu aata hai? And what triggers that, and then how do you deal with it? Yeah. Um, I think you should ask my husband. <laughs> Say that loudly. <laughs> so, you know, uh, probably uh, my family sees the, the, the bad side of Nandini. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, uh, at workplace, it's always the good side. So, uh, I mean, there's a pressure uh, to, um, you know, b uh, because you, when you are at the forefront, uh, you need to be at the best behavior at work because a lot of people are going to emulate you. Uh, I feel it's the same at home too. Um, health is, uh, like you said, um, uh, is important. And uh, one thing I, I, I like to do is have some me time, you know, not just for an exercise, but maybe just to have that cup of coffee. <laughs> I'm a coffee addict and I probably get up in the morning only to have that cup of coffee. <laughs> so uh, when you have uh, that me time, I think it allows you to think and plan your day and relax. Uh, so, um, so everybody has to find their own me time and that will probably uh, give you, uh, uh, it is part of getting uh, the good health part of it. Uh, like I think all men and women, I'm scared about gaining weight. <laughs> putting on weight. So uh, we do, uh, you know, that indirectly forces us to keep good health. Yeah. So that's interesting because I, I, you know, I now run a health startup and I often talk to women for hours and hours together and I say, so what is it that's finally bothering you despite your menopause, despite your mental health? She's like, actually a lot of things get sorted if I lose weight. And I, to hear you say that, Nandini, I'm very curious, why are you obsessing with it? Uh, and more importantly, why does it matter to you? No, because uh, like I said, they're all uh, interconnected, you know, good health and uh, keeping uh, uh, a good personality. And, you know, everything is interconnected and it also reflects on your work and your ability to uh, carry out your day-to-day -day works. And if you have even a small headache, you know, I'm sure the day won't go the same uh, uh, otherwise. So um, they're all interconnected, I think. So it's as important as to keep, you know, the normal uh, uh, BMI as to keep uh, 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 one um, active at work and at home. Yeah. Okay, we're going to switch weights from weight loss to heavy weights. Those three are heavy weights. We'll talk about the work they're doing. We're taking India to the sun. But what is this mission all about? And more importantly, why does it matter to India today? Dr. Shahji. Uh, you are asking about the mission's importance? Yes. Yeah. Uh, this Aditya Elvan mission is mainly for the two aspects. One is uh, because we, we live in earth because of sun. So it's necessary to know more about the sun, that sun process. You might have heard about geomagnetic storms, solar flares, and all those things, and how it impacts our earth. So it's one part. Of it. Other part is because uh, compared to yesterday's years, we have a lot of space asserts in uh, space, because uh, ISRO has almost 50 spacecrafts in, uh, alive in orbit. And so these are uh, the solar events like uh, that uh, storm, solar wind and solar flares that if it becomes intensive, it will affect our space asserts, which is already in space. So to protect that, now space weather is an important subject which is coming up all over the world. So like earth weather, how we predict uh, the uh, earth weather. So, so space weather also, it's still today, it is not very predictable. So the lot of models are being developed and this mission helps and also keep up with the uh, world going so that we will also have a better space weather model 
so that we can protect our space aspect, uh, space asserts. So these are the two main aspects behind this mission was conceived. And are to also to technologically to keep us in par with the world technology in space. Also, this is one of the reason behind why we go for uh, landing on the moon as well as the, this Aditya L1 missions, all these technologically challenging missions to keep us to gain respect See, we gain respect in the world, one, because of economy, as well, others is uh, technologically proud. So make us more technologically pro powerful, and our uh, technological prowess will be respected all over. These are all the aspects behind which these missions are being done. In that spirit, what is your idea of India? Yeah, idea of, as far as the space industry is concerned, if you see now, we are only 2% of the uh, world space economy, Indian space economy is contributing. So make it more as also uh, to lead uh, the world in space industry. That should be the idea of India of, as far as the space industry is concerned. Oh, big round of applause to that. <laughs> Dr. Anapurni, I want to ask you about the mega projects that India has announced around space uh, and our many missions, how do you see the next few years panning out for the work that you do? And talk to us a little bit about it. Yeah, so astronomy from India as such has been uh, a long story. And uh, uh, the uh, observations and the observatory set up in India has been a very long time uh, functioning, actually. Uh, the Indian Institute of Astrophysics Observatory in Kodai Kanal is actually celebrating 125 years. So we've been capturing the sun's data from that observatory for more than 100 years. So we've been studying it, uh, studying the nearest star. But we also have progressed with the nighttime observation. So we have the observatory in Ladakh, which is at uh, to the, uh, to the uh, 4,500 meters above sea level. And that we are operating remotely from Bangalore with the help of InSat uh, uh, satellites for the last 20 years. So it's astronomy capability and also engineering capability to, you know, do true astronomy has been quite well established. So India is looked up at a resource and also support for future astronomy missions that is either it be ground-based or space-based. So ground-based observations, uh, observatories, which are coming up in the next few decades are the 30-meter the telescope project. So India is actually a partner since 2014, and uh, uh, we are contributing at about 70% uh, in kind. So it's like a 30-meter huge mirror where the mirrors are segmented. So India's capability building in the terms of uh, engineer, very various engineering aspects. And in recently, you would have also known two major projects in which India is also partner, is the gravitational wave uh, detection, the LIGO, as well as the square kilometer array to look at the, the neutral hydrogen and the uh, universe at the uh, very, very early stages. So these are very mega projects, and India has become partner to it, and then cabinet has approved it. That means that the Indian um, uh, capability and the advancement in technology is actually going to, uh, contributing to it. world is looking at it. And the next 10 years, we'll be making uh, very important contributions in it. And we'll have LIGO Observatory in the country. And we will be contributing majorly to the detection of gravitational waves. So it's a major uh, times ahead. In that sense, uh, how would you sh say that this part of your journey contributes to that new idea of India that we're all thinking of? Yeah, it's part of the journey, of course, and I think a lot of people, a lot of teams are contributing, and uh, you can also see that the astronomy and astrophysics has become a topic and subject in various universities, various colleges, and all students want to do project, and you know, some uh, uh, want to know more about it. So that's a sensation which is happening, and along with the startups and the uh, space, uh, the space programs are also supporting it. So overall, it's actually a, a huge uh, impetus. And we see, we will see its huge growth in the ne next decade to come. Indeed. Uh, Nandini, we were talking earlier how Americans have gotten back onto the moon after yeah. half a century. Yeah. Um, it's a big one, but what's interesting is that there's a private player involved this yeah. time, and this is in the last 12 hours, for those of you who have not caught up. Tell us a little bit about why this is significant, and what does this tell us about India's journey on, you know, on many of these missions, including taking humans to the lower orbit of the Earth and many of the others? Uh, you know, uh, this also reminds me of uh, Dr. Vikram Sarabhai's vision. Uh, 
India has to be uh, amongst the foremost of the spacefaring nations. So um, if we need to establish ourselves as a country, as a leader amongst the world, uh, we need to have this uh, advanced satellites, not just in terms of, not just for our defense, not just for science, but satellites that will uh, directly impact the society and uh, change the way we live. Um, so um, I think that's important. And uh, also, um, you know, with the new space policy, so many private players coming in, uh, it's also, uh, I think it's going to get a lot easier with so many more people and money getting involved into space. And I'm sure India will do, uh, 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 India has an extremely bright future uh, with all the private players, the small universities and the startups pitching in now. Um, like, you know, it always reminds me of what Carl Sagan said. Uh, if mankind has to survive, we have to look for habitating <laughs> other planets. So with the dwindling, the kind of dwindling resources we have and the kind of population explosion that we have here, uh, it's time probably in our near future, we might have to think about living on other planets too. <laughs> and we shouldn't be left behind. <laughs> Certainly sounds exciting. One final word from all of you, especially because it's always about starting our day and our, our missions with the thought, what can we give and not just get? So maybe as three scientists, a couple of words on what you can do for women and girls in science. Yeah. Uh, compared to yesteryears, we are uh, progressively moving towards that and uh, more and more women are into uh, STEM. So one uh, thing is still uh, that the implicit bias that women is for such and such work only that still prevails in the society. So that has to be slowly has to be removed. So this type of, uh, especially like this uh, lot of um, role models and mentoring and towards that, that can improve a lot to the, uh, for the girl more and more to come to always, you know, I always, uh, say that, uh, see, everyone has a feeling that ma some mathematics is difficult. So it's not very difficult. It's, uh, you understand the logics. It's the most simplest of all. So such things we have to advocate to the uh, young people so that more and more uh, come to STEM. Um, I feel that, you know, we need to, um, we need to celebrate women's success. I mean, in every walk of life, not just scientists, and so that they become more and more visible, and uh, they serve as inspiration to so many girls in the, in the, probably in the villages and in the rural setup. They say, that, oh, okay, my God, you can, you, you have women now doing science, and you have women uh, who are big entrepreneurs. So, uh, so visibility is important. Celebrating success is not just to uh, give them the importance, but to let the world know that there are women doing this. I think we need to make STEM more, um, uh, more engaging and. Uh, uh, a, a little more, uh, the curriculum has to be more hands-on and more diverse in terms of making it interdisciplinary to make it more interesting. So uh, I might like mathematics, but I might not like, uh, you know, chemistry the same way. So you, you need to make it more interdisciplinary. And I think uh, more needs to be done at the grassroots levels to get more girls to study and, um, you know, inspire them, give them the resources. The final word from you, Dr. Anupin. Yeah, so I do engage with a lot of students who do masters and they go on to the research in science. And they're very, very passionate about what they're doing and they want to put in hard work and they want to excel in what they're doing and make a career out of it. But they do find problems when you settle down with your family and then uh, find a place where your family is and then, you know, work where you want to work and then your family is. Where do, you, where do I cut a balance and where do I strike a, a line and say that, do I step back and stay or move on to do something? So there are very difficult times for women at that juncture and we need a lot of women to come, uh, overcome that and come back, come to work and you know, be in the, uh, in the career front. But for that to happen, I think there must be a good amount of support to be extended and acknowledge that there is a problem here, you need to come out and create a space where they can come and contribute. And not, you know, inhibit them saying that, oh my God, I can't do it and take a step back. 
once you take a step back, it's difficult for them over a time scale to overcome that and come. We are losing uh, um, resources here. That should not happen, and that has to be acknowledged. And uh, I mean, it's not, there's no a common fix here, but then we need to address that. Then only we can bring the women workforce up front, and there are a lot of talent out there. They say it like it is. Give it up for India's scientists. Thank you very much. What an absolutely brilliant session this has been. Please do stay on stage. Uh, ladies and gentlemen at the ABP Network, we are celebrating individuals who are making lasting positive change to the society and our country at large. These are our change makers for good. And for advancing the cause of women in science, we would uh, like to felicitate all the scientists present on stage today. I'd like to invite C.P. Agarwal, Chairman G Gallen Group of Companies, and Rupali Fernandez, Chief Revenue Officer of ABP Network, to please join us on stage and do the honors. These are the Change Maker for Good Awards, and truly, these are deserving role models that we are honoring on this dais today. Let's hear it for Professor Subramaniam. Thanks to all our speakers. Let's give it up for Nandini Harinath. A huge round of applause, please. Let's keep the applause coming. These are change makers paving the way for India's success. Round of applause also for Dr. Nigar Shaji. Thank you all very much indeed. Our thanks also to Shelly Chopra for so beautifully leading this conversation. Thank you very much. Mr. Agarwal and Rupali for doing the honors. Thank you very much.